Hello, and once again, welcome to another journey into the Bible, to another look at the words that were written there that, even though they're 6,000 years old in some cases, were written to inspire us, to lead us, to direct us. And perhaps no words are more important than the words that we look at today. For today, I'm recording my Easter Sunday message. A Sunday Easter Sunday message that's perhaps a little unusual, perhaps one that's not quite the way you would have expected us to talk about Easter Sunday, but nonetheless, a viewpoint that I think is important. So, if you'll begin with by joining me in prayer, I'd appreciate it. Our dear Father in Heaven, as we bow our heads before Thee this morning to look at the, the story of Your Son, and the story of Your Son on the morning He was resurrected, we just ask that you might be with us. Bless us, Father, that we might be able to look at those words, listen to those words, to be f further inspired by those words. And Father, help us that we might be able to use those same words in telling others the story of your Son, the message of your Son, that message of love, forgiveness, and eternal salvation that so many people in the world still are not familiar with, that so many people in the world still do not understand. Bless us, Father, that we might have the opportunity to stand in front of, of such a person and explain to them why we are Christians. We recognize, Father, that we're not scholars. We don't have all the information, but we know what we know, and that is enough. And we have the commandment to go and to make disciples of all the nations. Bless us, Father, that we'll follow that command. And Father, above all else, let us even move just one person, one step closer to you, a step that they might be able to reach out their hand eventually and, and find you waiting for them, as you once did for each and every one of us. Thank you, Father, for that opportunity. Thank you for the freedom we have to express our thoughts and beliefs and to gather together in a country that guarantees our safety. And Father, above all, we thank you for sending the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who loved us enough that he would die for us so that we might live for him. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. The other day, I was discussing with my earth science class the origin of the universe and everything in it, according to the science of physics. Uh, you know physicists. They're the ones that deal with movement and work and force, energy. They perhaps enjoy the mathematics of science more than, than any other branch of science. Physicists deal in the in the realm of the mathematical, in the realm of the theoretical, the hypothetical. Uh, physicists deal with answers to the big questions like when and where did everything come from, although not the why. Physicists deal with the four universal forces in nature, the force of gravity, the force of electromagnetism, the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force. And, and physicists like to combine their, their knowledge, combine their discoveries, combine their theories. It wasn't too long ago that they managed to combine the electromagnetic force with the weak nuclear force into something they call the electroweak force. And shortly after that, they managed to discover or at least uh, discern that the, the force of gravity operated in, in similar ways to the, these two forces. And so they combined it also. And now physicists are, are striving to, to combine the, the strong nuclear force with the other three, uh, because if they do, then they feel they will have something they can call the grand unified theory. Uh, with that, their theories about the, the Big Bang and string theory, they, they can prove that once nothing existed and, and then all of a sudden everything existed. You can find out all about their discoveries and their their uh, explanations in any good, thick, current, up-to-date physics tests. Uh, if you can decipher the the scientific jargon and the and have a sufficient grasp of theoretical mathematics, or you can save them time by pointing to another text, a uh, text that already explains that once there was nothing and then all of a sudden there was everything. The text I'm talking about doesn't deal with the hypothetical, it doesn't deal with the theoretical, it doesn't deal with the mathematical, and it, and it doesn't require your knowledge of any particular sense of, of jargon. The text I'm referring to simply says, in the beginning, 
God. God created. I'm going to tell you something else that you may not know, something else you may not be aware of, and that is this. A scientist is never wrong. Let, let me prove that to you this way if I can. If I was to present this theory to you, my, my theory is this, that, that everyone watching this or listening to the sound of my voice within 48 hours will become a millionaire. Now, if for some reason that doesn't come to pass, and, and I'm basing that on the fact that somewhere in the world a new millionaire appears about every 48 hours, every, about every other hour. So 48 hours should be a, a, enough time for every one of us listening, every one of us watching, to become a millionaire in the next 48 hours. If by chance that doesn't happen, would that prove I was wrong? No, it doesn't, because I'm a scientist, and scientists are never wrong. It simply means I would have to revise my theory. You see, I would say something like, um, based on new information, or based on new evidence that I've seen, I just didn't have enough information to, to make my theory the way it should have been made, so therefore I'm going to revise that theory. Because you see, science is a way of thinking much more than it is a, a body of knowledge. So I'd like to compare that, that scientific approach, the, the physics text, with that other text I mentioned. The one that doesn't deal with the hypothetical, the one that doesn't deal with the theoretical, it doesn't deal with the mathematical, the one that doesn't require you to have any sense of any particular or peculiar sense of jargon. That text, that Bible, has parts that were written 6,000 years ago. And you know what? In those 6,000 years, that Bible has never been changed. It's never been revised. It's never been updated. And it has never been proven wrong. Can, can I read just a little bit from that book to, to tell you that once there was nothing, then suddenly there was everything? Genesis 1, uh, verses 3 and 4 says, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And let me follow that up with, Thus God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament, from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. Uh, it was so. Another good day. That's Genesis 1-7. And then, God called the, the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day, and that's from Genesis uh, chapter 1, verses 10 and 13. Then comes day 4, and God creates two great lights in the sky to rule the, the morning and the evening. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And on day 5, God created the, the, cre the sea creatures and the birds, and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them. That's Genesis 1, 21 and 22. Then comes day 6, the rest of the living creatures. And God creates man in his image. That's Genesis 1, 31. And it reads, Then God saw everything that he had made. And indeed, it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Once there was nothing. And suddenly, there was everything. Now, it doesn't matter to me whether you consider those six days of creation as six 24-hour days or 6,000 years or 10,000 years or, or any time period that those of you who care to envision a young earth uh, time scale choose to accept or whether you uh, accept the fact that those days, the, the yom of Hebrew, were days of, of inter, indeterminate length. The point is, God created. Once there was nothing, then there was everything. Now, no, notice one other point, if you will. Nowhere in the description God gave to Moses to, to write down in what would eventually become the book of Genesis, nowhere does God ever say that a day was anything but good. Even on the day when he created both the mosquito and the fly. In fact, 
In my reading of the Bible, I've never found a description of a day that says it was a, a bad day, or even a mediocre day, a poor day, or even a day that was questionable. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, wait, wait a minute, Pastor Chris. What about that day? What about that Friday? What about the day Jesus was crucified? Surely, that should be considered a bad day, or at least a poor day. No, not, not even that one. In fact, in spite of the fact that it was the day that Jesus was crucified, even that one can be considered a, can be considered a good day. Why can I say that? Recall that even as a young boy, in Luke 2.49, Jesus says, Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Then again, during his ministry, in John 6.38, he says, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And again from the Gospel of John uh, 14.31, As the Father gave me commandment, so I do. And finally, as the, the time came for Jesus to approach the cross, as he prayed in the garden, he says, Father, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Even that day, a day that will be burned across the collective minds of, of all Christians as a day of horror, a day of pain, a day of extreme suffering. Even that day was a good day the day that changed history forever. But as good as that day may have been, an even bigger, even better, more historic day was to take place just three days later. If you're a member of my regular Sunday school class at First Baptist Church of Lexington, Missouri, and you have your Gospel Project Sunday School manual with you, please turn to page 56, to see, or 46 that is, to see why that day was once again a, a good day, not only for the Lord, but for Christians everywhere, for all time. Our lesson begins with verse 11 of John's 20th chapter in his gospel, but, but let's set the stage a little bit first. It was the morning of the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene had gone to the tomb some versions say with other women, John speaks only of her, to anoint the body of Jesus with oils and spices. If you recall uh, the eve of the Sabbath, they had to take Jesus down from the cross and, and hurried, hurry to bury him because the sunlight, uh, sunrise, sunset was approaching and they couldn't do those, complete those kind of tasks on the Sabbath day. And so they hurried and uh, buried Jesus without the proper preparation for the body. Uh, so Mary Magdalene goes to the, the gravesite and she goes to, to anoint Jesus' body correctly with oils and spices to, to preserve it so that it won't smell bad as it, as it decays. And when she gets there, she finds the stone that had blocked the entrance to the tomb had been rolled away. She finds the tomb is empty. And nearly besides herself with, with grief, she runs to tell the eleven and what she has found. And, and Peter and John ran to the tomb with Mary following close behind, and they found the empty tomb, just as, as Mary had said. John tells us that the, the two disciples of the Lord were, were confused, and they left from there to return to their own homes. Uh, Turn, if you will, to page 48, for those, and for those of you following along in your own Bibles, we're in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 11. It reads like this. But Mary stood outside by the tomb, weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and, and looked into the tomb. I can understand her hesitation, not wanting to enter. This, this was a man, if, if indeed he was only a man, that had shown her respect, understanding, and love, when many in that society were not willing to do so. This was a man for possibly the first time in her entire adult life that was willing to 
offer her something without expecting anything in return. This was a man who was so much more than a man. This was Jesus Christ. This was the Savior. This was the Son of God, and, and she followed him because she believed in him. She loved him. She worshipped him. Then she saw him die in, in one of the most brutal ways imaginable. And due to the conflict with Jewish laws and procedures, she, along with other members of, the, of his followers, were unable to adequately prepare his body for burial. And now she was unable to do even that. His body wasn't there. Looking into the tomb from the outside, John 20, 12 tells us, she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one, the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Uh, Peter and John had found the, the burial cloths laid on the stone slab where the, the body of Jesus had lain. And, and I think a word of two of explanation might be okay to inject here. When Mary Magdalene saw the stone of the tomb ruled away, rolled away, she immediately thought the body of Jesus had been stolen. Uh, John 20, verse 2 provides us with that information. And she explained that thought to the disciples when Peter and John, the disciples that Jesus loved, came running to the, literally running to the tomb, and they looked inside. And when they did so, they found something surprising. They had listened to Mary's words, and, and even as they were running, they most likely expected to find nothing there, or at the very least, the the burial cloth scattered about uh, about the tomb. After all, one wouldn't expect grave robbers to be concerned with neatness and orderliness. However, that isn't what they found. John 20, verses 6 and 7 tells us that Peter, who was, who was first to enter the tomb, saw the linen burial cloth laying there, and the face cloth, which originally had been covering the head of Jesus, wasn't found lying with the other linen burial cloths, but folded up by itself. Now, there's much scholarly debate over this particular scripture. The story or legend or fable, which most likely developed on social media following a sermon sometime in 2006 or 2007, goes something like this. Every Jewish boy growing up observed his his father or his master at table and, and he noticed when they were eating if they were finished with the meal they would they would wad up the napkin or the tablecloth or the the uh, cloth they used to wipe their fingers and their mouth they'd wad that up and, and place it on the plate indicating that they were finished if instead they folded that napkin neatly and laid it on the plate that was to indicate they were leaving the table but that they would return now all of that presents a great story, but unfortunately there isn't any historical evidence to show that Jewish men, when they were eating, practiced such a display to indicate whether or not they were finished eating. The, the other word that comes up in the, the scholarly discussions is the word folded. Some translations do absolutely indeed use the word folded. The, the NIV and the New King James Version say folded. Others translate the word as, as rolled up. The New American Standard Bible, the ASV, the RSV, say rolled up or, or wrapped together, as the uh, King James Version does. Those descriptions all come from the, the Greek word entuliso, which means to, to twist or entwine. There's simply no scholarly agreement that the cloth in the, the tomb was some sort of a a table napkin, or that it was folded in any neat or meaningful way. The reason for John to utilize the time to write that the cloth placed over Jesus' head or face was separated from the rest of his clothes, the, the significance of that is found in John's response, in, in what he wrote. It wasn't shock, it wasn't dismay, it wasn't fear, it wasn't even confusion. Look at John 20, verse 8. It says, Then the other disciple, John, who came to the tomb first, went in also, 
and he saw and believed. You see, for John, the words that Jesus spoke after he had cleansed the temple, John finally understood what they meant. The temple, which was the body of Christ, had been destroyed. But on the third day, it was rebuilt. On the third day, he was resurrected. Jesus had risen in fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures and prophecies and in accordance with his own words. The linen cloths and the face cloths, however one determines to translate that, were all evidence of the resurrection John needed to fully understand exactly who Jesus was, exactly as he said he was, the Son of God. So, Let's return to, to Mary Magdalene at the tomb. She had just seen two angels, and the two angels speak to her. In John 20, 13, they said, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. At this point, John had believed. Peter was probably still questioning, and Mary was at at her very best, confused and, and still blaming grave robbers for the, the disappearance of their body. In her grief, in her confusion, her questioning, she turns away from the angels. Uh, page 49 in the Sunday School Manuals, if you're following along there. Uh, John 20, verse 14. She turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Mary saw only someone standing there. She, she didn't recognize who that was. And then that person, the person standing there, spoke to her. Verse 15a tells us, Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Now, it's apparent at this point that Mary didn't recognize the voice, the image or the visage of, of the man she had been following as a disciple for what have probably been years, John had accepted what he saw and believed, and Peter went away confused and perhaps still a little bit worried. More about Peter's reaction in a bit, but, but Mary was still hoping that somehow she would be able to, to locate the body of Jesus and, and anoint it with the oils and spices that she had, had brought to the the tomb with her. And Mary, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I'll take him away. That's verse 15b. And then the man that, that she supposed to be the gardener spoke to her. John twenty sixteen, Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher, the, the grief, the despair, the loss, the hopelessness, all, all of the emotions that were connected with her, her loss of the body of Jesus, the, her loss of the man she, she loved, worshipped, and followed as a son of, the, son of God, all of those emotions were removed in a moment of, of complete gratitude probably similar to the feelings that she had for Jesus when he first healed her from the demon that had possessed her. That's, we read about that in the first few verses of Luke's eighth chapter. It, it's a feeling that I could only begin to compare with the feeling I had when I, when I first realized that I'd become a Christian from accepting Jesus as the man that I would love and worship and follow as the Son of God. Perhaps you too can identify that feeling from incidents in your own walk. Page 50 in the Sunday School Manuals. Then Mary, in, in her joy, her, her happiness, almost overcome with the realization that her Savior was indeed alive, must have gone to Jesus and, and embraced him with all the strength her relief would allow her to express in, in a way that might seem that she would never let him go. And Jesus spoke to her again. John 20, verse 17a says, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, 
for I have not yet ascended to my Father. The word cling means to, to fasten onto or to, or to hold with force. As appropriate as that might have been for Mary, Jesus hastened to, remi- to remind her that he could not stay, for he had yet to ascend to his Father to wait the time when he would return for all time. But for now, Jesus had an errand that he needed Mary to run for him. Second part of verse 17 says, Go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Here in the second part of that 17th verse, Jesus sets about accomplishing several very important things. First, Jesus trusted Mary, a, a woman who may formerly be formerly have been of somewhat ill repute, to be the very first to carry the resurrection message to his followers, not only cementing Mary's position as a, as a disciple, but also as a woman of importance in a time when women simply weren't considered or looked at as being equal to men. Secondly, Jesus points out to to Mary that his apostles are are more than just followers, but they're brothers, in a sense that all of us who belong to his family are brothers and sisters. Then finally, the third point that Jesus makes is this. Jesus tells Mary to tell his followers that he is going to ascend to his father, who is also our father. The one who's not only the God of Jesus Christ, but also the God of all mankind. Is it, is it any wonder that with this thought in mind, Jesus later tells us and asks each of us to go and, and to make disciples, to make followers of all people, of all those he would have as eternal residents in those mansions that he went ahead of us to prepare? Mary, even though she was reluctant to to release her resurrected Savior, now had the belief and the faith that she needed to sustain her. And she left Jesus there at the side of the tomb and returned to the eleven to, to share with them the news that at that point only she was aware of. Verse 18 tells us, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. It was shortly after that time that Jesus appeared to the apostles and offered them a a greeting of peace. And then following 40 days during the time which we we recall the stories of the doubting Thomas and the forgiveness of um, restoration of Peter who had denied knowing Jesus three times before Jesus was crucified, and during that time, he appeared to many as, as many as 500 at one time. Uh, Jesus was seen by many of the faithful. And then Jesus returned to his Father, our Father, his God and, and our God. We've heard the story of Easter many, many times. We've heard it from the viewpoint of, of those who were present. We've heard it from the apostles those and those who wrote the Gospels. We've heard it from the viewpoint of of the Romans, from the centurion who said, surely this was the Son of God. We've heard it from his followers. We've heard it from the the gospel writers, from historians, from theologians, from scholars. And we've heard it from musicians. The story has been retold now for some 2,000 years. And we never tire of it. And why? Well, I think it's because in that story we hear all the important things we need to know about the Lord and Savior. If I was to paraphrase his own words, it would be something like this. Jesus said, and the Bible records, I will come, and it happened. Jesus said, I will die, and it happened. Jesus said, I will resurrect, and it happened. Jesus also said, I will return. That has yet to happen. But I would remind you, it's time to get ready. One of my 
One of my favorite versions of the telling of that story comes from a musician, a, a Christian singer by the name of Don Francisco. He tells the, the story from the point of view of, of Mary, from the point of view of John, but more importantly, from the point of view of, of Peter, the one who is still a little bit lost, a little bit confused, perhaps a little dismayed because he was the one who had denied knowing Jesus. John had left the, the tomb convinced he'd seen a miracle. Mary believed. But Peter, Peter left the tomb confused, unsure, perhaps, perhaps even doubting what he had seen and believed. It's Peter's story that Dan, Don Francisco told. And if, if you have the opportunity, if you'd like to take the time, I would recommend that you, you Google Don Francisco's story, Don Francisco's song. It's entitled, He's Alive. And in it, I find perhaps my, my favorite retelling of the story of Christ's crucifixion. It doesn't have any of the details. It doesn't have any of the gore. It doesn't have any of the brutality. It simply tells of one man's coming to faith, one man's final acceptance of Jesus as Lord and Savior, the man that was Peter. Please do it. Please please go to Google or wherever you happen to go, or perhaps even to your own record or album collection, and find the story of the resurrection of Jesus. He's Alive by Don Francisco. Until then, I'd ask that you pray with me until we join again together next week. Please pray. Our dear Father in heaven, we've looked at the story of the resurrection once again, and once again it inspires us, it thrills us, it satisfies us. Satisfies us, Father, to know that the prophecies, the words, the predictions of the entire Old Testament, which has never been changed, never been revised, and never been updated, all those words point to the coming of one who would be your son, one who would come to save mankind from being themselves. Thank you, Father, for that gift. Thank you for allowing us to look at that story. Thank you for giving us the, the privilege of living in a country where we have the freedom to, to own a Bible, the freedom to read a Bible, the freedom to gather together and discuss that Bible, to, to see what those messages, some 6,000 years old, have for us today. And the message that we have from the resurrection of your son is simply that, Father. Jesus came, he died, he was resurrected, and he will come again. Bless us, Father, that we might have the opportunity to share that message with others, perhaps with people who've never heard the name Jesus Christ, or if they've heard the name, perhaps have never read his works, or if if they've read his works, perhaps never fully understood what that means to them. We recognize, Father, that we're not scholars. We're not fully biblically knowledgeable. We just ask, Father, that you'll give us the strength, the conviction, the belief in ourselves that we might boldly be able to stand in front of another and say, yes, I am a Christian, and let me tell you why. Bless us, Father, this, this Easter time that we might be able to take that message to even just one, and that we might be able to move that one even just one step closer to you, a step closer where eventually they'll be able to reach out their hand and find you waiting for them as you once did for each and every one of us. Thank you, Father, for that privilege. Thank you, Father, for that opportunity. And thank you, Father, for allowing us to read the story of Easter once again. And we pray always in the name of the, the subject of that story, your son, our brother, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much for, for joining with us. Thank you for coming to, to visit with us each and every week. It's an honor. It's a, it's a privilege. Uh, I, I feel like I can only do what the Lord allows me to do, but it's, it's rewarding for me. I hope somewhere in the words that, would, that I speak, in the, the scriptures we read, in the things we discuss, and the things we look at, you can find some, 
some message there for you, some personal wording, some personal input, some personal message that, that's intended just for you. And that in accepting that message and enjoying that message, that you might be able to find time to share with others. Until we meet again next week and continue our stud study of the, the New Testament, I bid you a pleasant day, a pleasant Easter, and ask that God bless you. Goodbye.